Welcome to the A16Z podcast. I'm Michael Copeland. We were lucky enough to have the founders of three venture capital firms down to A16Z recently. Anne Winblad of Hummer Winblad Ventures, Aileen Lee of the new firm Cowboy Ventures, and Teresa Gao of another new firm, Aspect Ventures. They were joined by Lisa Lambert from Intel Capital and Andreessen Horowitz's own Margaret Wenmacher's in a conversation that examined the basics of venture capital, the tech trends that each are keen on today, as well as the path that each of these women took to get where they are in the venture capital world. Margaret Wenmacher's moderates the conversation. There's a whole set of topics, but for those of you who want to be in this chair one day, it'd be interesting to hear what your path has been into the VC job. And you want to start? Sure. Um, I, um, first of all, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics um, and a minor in computer science. Um, so I started early investing in software as a track for my career. Um, I worked for a year as a systems programmer at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and quit my job and, and started as a software entrepreneur where I actually did, for better or worse, write some of the code. Um, when my company was acquired um, in Minneapolis, I moved out here to Silicon Valley. And my intention was to continue being an entrepreneur. Uh, but uh, John Hummer um, wanted to start a software firm and uh, stalked me for about a year and a half. And he's tall. And so he's 6'10". He's the tallest venture capitalist, I think. <laughs> I, I, I could be the shortest. <laughs> I wear, perhaps. Um, and you know what so I didn't actually think about being a venture capitalist or what skills or capabilities I needed um, you know I'm, I'm pretty much a product of the software industry and I still think of myself as being in the software industry and I just happen to be a venture capitalist and would you say that that makes you particularly attractive to entrepreneurs just because you have been in their shoes how um, big I, a factor is that I, you know I think they're you know, now I've been in their shoes such a long time ago that they think they're wearing different shoes. <laughs> uh, but they that's are. not true. Uh, or Birkenstocks or flip flops. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, in the beginning, it was really helpful. Um, and it was, and it's also good to be able to, they're just on that topic, uh, another 30% of our time is what I'll call general psychodrama. <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> You know, our jobs, I mean, we, we hand over the money directly to the entrepreneurs and say, have at it. And, you know, we, you know, we don't know how most of these entrepreneurs scale until they either do scale or don't. One of the big jobs of the board is to hire and fire the CEO. And I'm sure all of us have had to fire CEOs or have help them exit gracefully from the building quickly. Um, you know, sometime in our career. So, you know, having been in the shoes of hiring people, uh, hiring a lot of people, and, you know, managing engineers, um, understanding how hard it is to build companies from scratch from the standpoint of a CEO is very helpful. From my standpoint, I also think if you're doing enterprise software, you really have to be able to lift up the hood. Because you know the the business descriptions are usually coming from engineers. Um, you know, then there's business models on top of that. And if you don't really understand what these products are intended to be, or actually what the technical shifts in the market are, it's pretty hard to be a core enterprise software investor. All right, um, Aileen, sure. Path. So um, I I. What did go to MIT for undergrad, but I was never a kind of working engineer. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, and then I also went to grad school. I always loved consumer businesses, so I actually worked for the North Face in Odwalla when I was at business school. And then actually I worked for Busy Burt, Burt who's in the audience here at Gap when I graduated um, from uh, business school. And so I was going up like a consumer path. I thought maybe I would be like a VP of marketing or CMO or a COO someday. Um, and I always thought venture capital sounded really cool. I was an analyst at Morgan Stanley, and like you know, after your second year of these analyst programs, a lot of people do a third job, and like venture capital sounded amazing. But the two people types of people who were applying for jobs as like analysts in venture capital were like guys who grew up in like Danbury, Connecticut, and they're you know what I mean, and, and like they went to Dartmouth or Princeton, and they played squash, and like their dads were super rich. 
and then um, or like the gunner guys who went to Wharton and like carried a briefcase to a school and like were wore bow ties. Like I just figure I would never fit into. I don't still. You still so, feel like, that not way? much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't even think about it. And then when I was at Gap, I was kind of helping to build the online business in 99, and I just kind of got lucky, and I got the job at Kleiner Perkins, um, and I thought I would stay for two or three years and then go into an operating role, because I didn't know that much about Silicon Valley, and I figured it'd be a good place to learn, and I did learn a ton. And so I wound up staying for a long time, and I did take two years to actually go be the founding CEO of one of our portfolio companies. So I ran that and raised $20 million and kind of hired the team, shipped product, built revenue, bought a couple companies, and then went back to Kleiner full time. So I feel like I did my kind of like my stint. very difficult stint in the trenches, um, and that's kind of my background. All right. Um, so I also have an engineering undergraduate degree. Um, I, uh, other than summer internships, like at General Motors and at British Petroleum, with literally a thousand engineers and two women. Uh, um, so that was my knowledge. And uh, no one. So uh, I'm first generation Chinese immigrant. My my father, you know, dentist. All of his brothers doctors. My mom was a nurse. That's what I was supposed to do. I Chinese did, women with dentist parents. That's really yeah, that, the, that's, that's the, the That's the key spec. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who did not want to go to medical school? Right? So, so being an engineer was like, that was the next acceptable thing. Anyway, I, I give that only as like, I had no idea what venture capital was or entrepreneurship or anything, right? But working in those companies, I was like, oh, you know, being like the engineer in the CAD, behind the CAD machine, that's okay, but not super exciting. The product managers, they seem to have much cooler jobs. Um, they actually at least have input into like, you know, why we're building what we're building. So given that, the eager beaver type A uh, firstborn child that I was, I went back to school and said, okay, well, I, evidently I need to get an MBA uh, in addition to my engineering degree, and so how do I get one of those? So I interviewed for investment banks and consulting firms because it seemed like that would give you a good chance to get into business school. Everything was about sort of like two steps ahead. Um, and then I went to work at Bain, um, and that was great experience, and then I came out here to Stanford, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to be a product manager back then, I'm giving my age, at Hewlett Packard. That was like my goal in life after graduating from business school. I was a product manager that summer at Silicon Graphics, which was actually a really great time to be there. Um, it was like the Jurassic Park year. It was very cool. <laughs> um, and so from that, though, I got a little bit more of a taste of like, oh, you could actually like work at like maybe not such a big company. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, you know, that was once, it was a billion dollar company by then, but it had been a startup by a bunch of guys who had left places like Sun and Silicon Graphics. And did your parents lose faith in you every oh, step of the way? Oh, every step of the way. Every step of the way. My, my parents have never once understood any career decision or job that I've ever had. No. But now they've finally stopped worrying about whether like, I'll be able to support them in their old age. Okay. So it's OK now. My parents still call me and they're like, do you need money? Are you OK? Oh, oh yeah. When I started my firm, my dad was totally. like, I know you've been helping us, but like, now that you're at a startup, like, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my story's a bit long. So I became a venture capitalist sort of by accident. I was an entrepreneur. So after, after business school, a couple of people that I had gone to Stanford GSB with had started a company and had just raised um, a seed round from DFJ. Um, I actually knew Jennifer. We worked at Bain together before business school. Fast forward five years. We just raised our seed round. I joined. I ran, you know, product, um, marketing, sales, basically everything that required talking to people outside of the building. <laughs> Customer support was fun. Um, and uh, Tim Draper and Jennifer actually were our lead investors, and that was when I reconnected with her. Um, so she was uh, an observer on our board. And that was really how I even understood really what venture capital was, was by helping to raise like $15 million of venture capital and going through three rounds of funding. And at the end of that, you know, I wanted to go do another startup again. Um, we'd had three CEOs in 12 months, so I thought it was time for me wow. to leave. Um, I, was, I was young and not so smart, but I was smart enough to figure out that that probably wasn't a good sign for my startup. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was, it, was, it was late 98, early 99, and um, a couple of the other VCs who were on my board, knowing my background, said, you know, I'll introduce you to three other portfolio companies um, at various stages to see whether you want to do early or later. I'm also going to introduce you to some other VCs who are looking for associates or analysts who, you know, your background seems like it could be interesting. You have experience in the internet. I kid you not. That was what they said. Anyway, turned and so, out to be a big deal. Turned out to be a big deal. 
Yeah. Very big deal. Who knew? This crazy internet e-commerce thing. So, um, and that's how I ended up at Excel, and I joined as an associate, and you know, worked my way up through the ranks, became a partner, and eventually a managing partner, and then started my own firm. All right. Wow, great. Okay, so I'm from Toledo, so my story is not nearly as interesting. <laughs> I grew up in, in Ohio. Uh, I do have a technical, technical degree, so I was a software developer uh, for the first three or four years of my career. I worked in IT at a company in my hometown, Owens Corning. I got my Bachelor of Science uh, at Penn State and absolutely had no idea what, what venture capital was. It wasn't even a thought back where I was from. So I knew I wanted to do something in business, and I knew I didn't want to sit behind a desk and code for the rest of my career, so I decided that I was going to be a general manager. That was a way for me to get access to what looked like to be the, the moving and shaking in, in the company, right? These are guys that ran P&Ls. So I embarked on a uh, ambitious plan to get my company to sponsor me on a business rotation. So I, I got out of IT and I did sales, I did product marketing, I did strategic planning. It was kind of a mini GM uh, prep course, if you, were, if you will. I did that for about three or four years and then realized I needed to seal the deal with an MBA. So I went to HBS and got my uh, master's in business. And then I looked out over the horizon and I said, Silicon Valley is where I've got to be. Kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to be in Silicon Valley. You know, I, I knew I wanted to be in tech again. And so Intel was a great platform. I had other opportunities uh, with other tech firms that you would know. Uh, but opted to take the Intel offer and, uh, you know, I've been happy with that. I mean, I, I started as a product marketing engineer and then product marketing manager at Intel. So I was doing technical marketing with our PC OEMs and it was the desktop business. So it was the cash cow. So a lot of tension there, a lot of resources. And after doing that for about three years, I thought, wow, Intel's a big company. What else can I do? <laughs> because, you know, you're not really putting the MBA together, I mean, to use, right? I'd, spent $100,000 on an MBA and I figured I probably should be using it instead of writing technical papers and talking to IT people uh, and PC uh, people. So I, I went looking and uh, fortunately found what was then called corporate business development is now called Intel Capital and I've been there for 14 years. Those are four different stories but I think they have a lot in common, right? A lot of sort of in the trenches experience and then somehow magically you fall into it, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know that anybody had a plan to There's be no, a VC. Like, no, so, no path, I think. Which, yeah. uh, which is interesting. Venture capital is a bit of a black box, and I think it's also, it, it's been a part of a strategy of most firms to not really talk that much about what goes on in there. So in the spirit of demystifying it, I'm going to ask Teresa, I'm going to just pick on you first. Um, what do you think of venture capital? Like, what do you do all day? Like, <laughs> what are, what is it actually that happens? I know there's, at some point, there's a meeting with an entrepreneur, but like, how do you get there? Um, so my, my daughter asked me that question, too. And my answer to her is like, meetings, lots of meetings and phone calls. Um, we want the next level then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I would say is there's really, uh, if you think about it, once you're sort of up and running as a venture capitalist, your, the things that you spend your time on are split between the companies that you've already invested in and that you're usually on the board of and meeting potential new companies, new entrepreneurs, and new executives that you're trying to recruit into your companies. So um, in any given day, it might be that you would have a board meeting for one of your companies or you might have uh, an interview. You're looking for a VP of marketing for one of your companies. So, you know, every day is different, but if you look in a long, long term, I think it's maybe half of your time on existing company board work and maybe half of your time looking at new companies. And so there's this magical world word deal flow, Aileen. So, you know, how, how do you find the deals? Do they all just magically walk in the door, you know, right. that's a huge, you know, that's the magic that you have yeah, to Yeah, I was going to add to Teresa's, which is like, you spend half your time meeting with new companies, half your time working with portfolio companies, half your time doing email, <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah half your time Teresa. running your firm. I mean, it's like a 24-7 job. I think that's one of the things that um, people who have maybe been entrepreneurs or operators in companies who join venture firms usually say after the first year, year like, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it was. Like I, when I think about my job, my job is seeing the best ventures that are started every month or every year, making the right calls on them, which is as important as seeing them. But if you don't see them, you're not gonna be able to make the right call, right? And then you have to actually 
like hopefully add value to help them to get to a great outcome. You know, and then you have to think about like running your firm there, and marketing your firm so that pe you're going to get to see the best deal. So that's kind of like how I spend the, my there, time. There's a thing that mm -hmm. I think you left out mm -hmm. um, that is winning the deal. Because I yes. think the good deals are competitive. That's true. That's so, totally true. Uh, and yeah. what's your, like, how do you think about winning the deal? Maybe you don't have, you have less pressure after 25 years. Well, I think um, everybody has to cultivate their own unique deal flow. That's sort of part of it so that you're not out there chasing deals. And that really is what uh, separates the top venture firms from the other venture firms. Because if you have to chase deals and try to get into them, it's a lot of time uh, and you frequently don't get the deal. So I think everybody on this panel really does a good job in cultivating unique deal flow and looking ahead to some of the trends in the industry and who might you know, step out of companies. And the advantage we all have after doing it over a decade or several decades is that you know, you get to see a crop of people that you've helped recruit into these companies. And it's not always your CEOs that start the next company. It might be the VP of product management or the VP of engineering. So you can't get lazy about deal flow. Yeah, one of the challenges about deal flow is all the stuff we get over the transom. Yeah. And it's a real challenge because you don't want to throw it all the way, all away, but you cannot meet with every entrepreneur who approaches you. So, yeah. you know, the, the signal to noise ratio is, is interesting in venture capital because we're, we're running around with dollar signs on our head. On the entrepreneur side, how do you, we also can't meet with every potential VC, and yet we need to have a feedback cycle so that we make sure that we're you know, setting ourselves up for success and finding the right VCs to provide our funding. So what, how do we decide if you are the one to reach out to, or other than, okay, well, we're going for A, let's say, and we're looking for, and we're in the enterprise space, how do you recommend people self-select to contact you, and how do you decide on the other side who you reach back to? Well, those are two questions that we might have different answers to. Um, uh, you know, when our companies are out raising money and another 30% of our 300% time is actually helping our companies <laughs> raise their follow-on rounds, there, there are a lot of venture firms, and many venture firms have almost telemarketing people that are calling up these companies. And our co I'll go to a board meeting and our CEO will say, well, someone called me from so-and-so. And, -so. and you know, it, it does make sense for you to spend some time thinking about the lay of the land of which set of venture capitalists uh, you should approach. It also is determined a bit by who does your first round and right. who their collegial circle is that they've worked with. Because you do want like-minded investors around the table so that your own investor circle and your board meetings themselves don't turn into a circus. Um, so I would leverage your seed stage investors, your A round investors for the follow on ones. It gets easier then. Um, and I'm surprised all the time um, that even when we give companies a term sheet, you know, I always say, hey, you should talk to our CEOs. Mm -hmm. Or even before we give you a term sheet, talk to our CEOs. Um, you know, find out if we're the right investor for you because, you know, once you get us, it's hard to get rid of us <laughs> <laughs> forever. The second question, which is how do we uh, deal with over the transom, I would say that every partner in our firm is different. Um, you know, I, I feel like I was sort of a non-pedigreed entrepreneur in my early days, so I was over the transom in every way you could describe. <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't call anyone and say, will you call someone for me? I was just sort of like knocking on doors. Uh, so I have, you know, kind of a sweet spot for actually looking at the over the transom stuff. And, you know, it turns out that some You're of You're going to get a lot of stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out that some of our best deals ever were, you know, something caught my eye or someone else's eye. It does take a bit more time, but also I, I, I once a week say, look, I've got to be five entrepreneurs that I've never heard of before, that I don't know, that might be in a different cir circle or set of people. Otherwise, I'm, I'm treading the same path over and over, which is easy, but it's not going to get great returns. The thing I'd add to the over the transom, because I think it is probably more often um, rare that an over the transom venture gets funded by a traditional venture firm and then it becomes a big hit. Um, I think you're best shot if you aren't being 
if you don't know the people to refer you into an, a target investor is to have traction. Like when I think about mm -hmm. companies like Nasty Gal or Monocloth, just like they had traction, they were kind of like unknown, but they were able to write and be like, hey, I bootstrapped this on my own and I'm doing yeah. five or 10 million in revenue. Then you'll get someone's attention. But if you're, I've got this idea, I don't really know anybody, can you, then, then you're most likely to get people's attention. Yeah. The only thing I'd add on the first part about, um, you know, how do you f pick the right VC um, partner? And I'm being very specific, not just firm, but the right partner, because as Anne says, you know, you're likely going to have this person, you know, it used to be six years, the last stuff I've seen is like 10 years. So you're going to be on board with this person for 10 years. Um, so you're really, um, let's hope that, you know, you guys work well like together. It's a bunch of marriages, so. Uh, wow. Yeah. It was really yeah. last time. Right. Longer, than, longer than most celebrity ones by a long shot. Um, so, yeah, it's your work, it's your work marriage. Um, so what I always tell entrepreneurs is that you should think about this as it's a two-way street. Just like, just like when you're recruiting for, for a, an employee to your company or you're interviewing for a job, which is something you guys can all, it, in actuality, it's a two-way street, right? So yes, absolutely. I would assume that you would have you know, done research on Lisa or Anne or Aileen and you know some of the investments they've made, you probably therefore should talk to some of their entrepreneurs and then it won't be an over the transom introduction because you're just doing your homework. You want to make sure like what is it like to work with them? Do they, are they interested in the space that I am in or the business model that I'm pursuing? Because it's also about you know, what's the fit with their expertise, their network, their value add um, to be on your board for that. And the last thing that I would say is absolutely 150% what Ann said, and this was, I included in my half of the time with companies, it's not board meetings, right? It's all the other stuff. It's, it's recruiting people I didn't explicitly call, but absolutely, I view, I've always viewed my job as an as a early stage venture investor is to help my companies get financed through to whatever is the best outcome for them, whether that's an IPO, which does tend to take 10 years, <laughs> having been through that a couple of times, um, or an acquisition. And you know, my job is to help you find the right partner for your Series B, C, or expansion round. And Jen and I were counting it up when we launched our firm. I mean, between the two of us, we probably helped our companies raise over 350 rounds of follow-on venture capital. That's the kind of stuff that you should be wanting from your investment partner. And then, and lastly, understanding the difference between a private venture firm and a corporate venture firm. Of course, we're, we're Intel, so we're a big company, so you gotta want a lot of love, right? Because you're gonna get a whole lot of love <laughs> from Intel, it's a beast. Uh, and so, you know, understanding what's unique about a corporate, you know, do you want a business relationship with a company? Are you looking for go-to-market support? So we've got channels and we've got resources in other regions to get you visibility with your customers. Um, you still are going to be subject to the partner that you choose, so you should also do the research on the individual, but you're going to have a whole lot more help than that, and, and hold them to it, right? I mean, corporates promise a lot of things sometimes, but make sure they deliver on the things that they promise. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, so Aileen and Teresa, you are, um, Aileen, do you, have a, do you have a partner at the firm? I do have a team member, yeah. Okay. Man or woman? Guy. Okay. And so you have a female firm. Is is there does is that by design or is that just because you've known Jenna forever and you make good partners? Um, it really was because um, we've known each other for a long time and we we knew that we had the same philosophy about both the type of firm that we wanted to start mm -hmm. in terms of the the market opportunity that mm -hmm. we saw having come from bigger firms like seeing this what we think of as a white space with a big getting bigger right. um, and you know, multi-geography, multi-stage, which was not what either of our firms were when we joined in mm -hmm. 96 or 99. Um, but also, so actually we were independently thinking of doing our own thing, going out and doing seed and early stage mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that we loved to do. And as we were talking, truly more networking as we had been over the course of our careers around mm -hmm. stuff like, you know, there aren't that many women managing partners. Um, so talking about stuff like, okay, what's your philosophy on, you know, how to hire people and when to promote people. So we knew we had a lot of commonality in mm -hmm. terms of culturally how we wanted to run our firms. So it gave us a lot of comfort. And we were literally like comparing notes on like stuff, which I did with Aileen as well about like, okay, who should you hire as like your rent a CFO and right. all that other stuff. And at one point she was literally just like, you know, it sounds like we want to do the same thing. Why, why should we do this, do this together? And have you seen the, or the number of um, female founders that you've been able to invest in? Has that 
grown at all? Do you see more women entrepreneurs these days than you saw when you first got started? Well, we and you obviously are focused on enterprise software. So. Yeah, we just gave a term sheet to a um, uh, woman co-founder, woman CEO firm last week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she got a lot of attention from, you know, our partnership because we don't really see that many women in enterprise software. It's, it's pretty shocking, actually. Um, again, um, if you look at the stats coming um, along, you know, the, the number of computer science science majors in the U.S. is, is not that large. It's the going down for it's women. It's going down. Yeah. It's going down for women. It was like, you know, 20 percent, and now it's like 13 percent. Um, most of the women coming in, uh, and, and actually most of our um, founder, you know, CEO types, there are a good number that do have an MBA. I mean, they, they want that job as a CEO. They've got the advanced degree. Other than Stanford and Harvard, um, which has a higher percentage of um, women as MBAs, only about the typical MBA class in other universities is 20 to 25 percent. So we're dealing with a law of small numbers here for qualified to, you know, to, to the, the enterprise software market is very large now, very competitive. Um, you know, the skill, the bar keeps rising for entry-level skill other than your some, you know, wonderkind who, you know, has, thinks of something in their dorm room. Um, so, you know, we were really excited to give her this term sheet. She's super qualified. You know, we won't be announcing that deal for some time. Um, and she just did a fantastic job of, you know, presenting her idea, her concept. Um, and she was very authentic. That's another thing that um, my partners and I really liked about her. She was very open about, you know, what she thought uh, the opportunity was, as well as the challenges. You know, we got to know her really quickly. She she really, really was herself. She wasn't. She was very comfortable in her own skin as a right. woman. She wasn't. She hadn't gone to like prep classes somewhere to be prepared to present to venture capitalists and sort of was acting the role. And the VCs noticed that and it's really not a good idea. It doesn't so, help you at all. You know, but the answer to your question is, um, you know, it's pretty much on change. We gave our first term sheet to um, Heidi Roizen and Tea Makers. So we you. started with a woman, but it hasn't changed much. It's very mm -hmm. disappointing. How about you? What, what female deals do you so guys see? I do think there are a lot more female founder CEOs than there were when I started in 99, especially in the consumer side. Right. In the consumer side. Um, and the enterprise side, I think it's, it's much thinner. And I think for any of you who are working in larger companies right now, and you're at like, you know, the director, VP level, you are an awesome candidate to be a founder. Um, I think most of the best founders have good training from existing tech companies that have high growth. And so whether it's you or it's someone you work with, you know, I think my frustration in there not being as much kind of gender balance in tech is, you know, we have like, I think challenges at every stage of the pipeline from who the investors are to what the kind of supply side looks like. And if there aren't great women who are directors and VPs at tech companies, we're not going to increase the number of female CEOs. And so, like, if you see some superstars who don't, like, you don't think they're going to stay in the workforce, like, encourage them, support them to stay in, because we have to keep this pipeline increasing, not decreasing. Otherwise, it's never going to get better. I'll give you an example. I mean, Diane Green, of all fabulous people, yeah. was told by someone, you should do your own company. So. <laughs> That, uh, to me, that's an incredible anecdote. It's not yeah. like she had this plan all along. So if, if you're wondering if you should, you might want to really think about yeah. it. Yeah. Aileen said one other really key thing is that when we you know, are auditioning these companies uh, we, and we, we get attracted to one, we, we look at the founding team and see what movies have they seen before. <laughs> have they only been working at horror shows? You know? <laughs> uh, so you know, this is one thing for your own career as well. If you are in a horror show, leave. Because you want to you know, see how, what a good movie is like. What's the difference as you look at it between the power and influence you had as one person in a Kleiner or an Excel versus the kind of power influence that you have to make an impact as uh, you know, a founder in your own smaller funds? I mean, so I take a lot of inspiration from my entrepreneurs, and I'll, I'll use that as an analogy, right? So and many of you are, uh, some of you are entrepreneurs, some of you are 
executives at larger companies, right? So you can be an executive at a larger company, and it's not that it's a it's not that it's a bad place, or you know, it can be a great place. But the amount of change and the speed at which you can make change because of the end number um, is just much slower and much different, and the amount of impact you can have. And so when you're a founder, um, you know, it's your vision. It's you know, you get to start from sort of the you know from blank sheet of paper. Um, so I think it's I think that's the difference. That that was kind of what what kind of drove me. It was sort of I had an entrepreneur who told me once when it was sort of like had sort of done it like three or four times. It's sort of like why why are you doing this again, right? And it was sort of like I just feel like I'm called to this. It's like I really see something that I want to do, and I can't you know where I am is a great place, but I can't do that here. It just doesn't fit. So the only way I can do that is to go out there and do it myself. And also fundamentally, like um, I think a lot of entrep great entrepreneurs. Are, are kind of impatient, and for any of you who know me, I'm yep. extremely impatient. And so you can move a lot faster yep. when you're just kind of a much smaller group. I would totally echo what Teresa said. I think, um, obviously, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't think it was better. <laughs> um, and it's, it's like, now I'm two years into it, it's way better. Um, and it's, I was also inspired by some entrepreneur friends. I was having dinner with some friends, and this was probably three years ago, um, who are entrepreneurs, and they were asking me about changes going on at Kleiner and things like that, and we were kind of talking a little bit about what was going on, and they were like, when are you going to leave to start your own firm? And honestly, it, had it wasn't not, if, it was it when. It had not crossed my mind, to be honest. Like, you know, Kleiner's super socially respectable. It's a big platform. We had great deal flow. Like, I think... In my mind, I had been thinking, like, I think I'm an intelligent person. I think I have a lot to bring to the table. But a lot of people want to talk to me because I'm a Kleiner partner. Maybe not necessarily because I'm me. And I think I could do a good job even if I was just me. And so it was that dinner that really inspired me. Like, I could do that. Why wouldn't I But do isn't that? that amazing? I hear that so often yeah. that women are sort of asked to go yeah. do it. I and I had we it somehow seem to be waiting for someone to tell us that we should go do it. Yeah. So go do it, <laughs> whatever it is that you want yeah, to do. Exactly. Um, well, anyhow, uh, what about you, Margit? I mean, you you were running a you know a top yes. uh, marketing firm and uh, seemed like you know you know leading a, another sector. How how was the transition out of one industry? I'm I'm changing. I'm being the moderator right now. <laughs> how was the transition from a totally different industry? where you worked with a lot of entrepreneurial companies into, right. into the I, I will say when I first moved to this country, I worked at an agency that was chock full of women. It was run by men, and that really was annoying to me <laughs> because the, my home industry is like chock full of women, and that was just weird. So it was really fun to start my own because you can put your, the, the imprint of the values that you have and the culture and, and what you want to make that's bigger than just what you do every day. And there's nothing more gratifying than that. And I have a child, and I have the, the outcast agency, and that, that is my other child still. And um, if, you, if you think that you might like that, you will love it. That, that is absolutely amazing. The reason that I made this weird decision to come here, because I don't like being an employee, like I, 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 there was not, um, that part was not attractive. But um, I thought at the time, maybe that was naive, but I thought that the list of top five firms was very, very established and it was almost, that it was going to be very tricky to become one of those. And I didn't know that I could do that and that, that was the job, at least the, the spec that I was asked to do. And then I liked, um, I liked the values of the founders and the, the way they had set it up and I liked the fact that it, it was a partnership but it, it had like, normal hierarchies because some of that stuff gets dysfunctional but fundamentally I did it because I knew how to run Outcast and I didn't know that I could do this and the, this kind of job doesn't come around every other day right so that that was the reason I, I did it. An amazing job. An amazing job. I have a lot to work with um, and I will also say uh, thank you but we have a lot to improve because we're like not even five years old. What elements do you think the culture that you will cultivate for your firms that you really want to make different from where you came from? So Cowboy Ventures is pretty small. It's just myself and another person. And I don't actually know if it's ever going to get very big. Like I, like, I came from a place that started small and got very big. And I didn't really like it as much when it got really big. So I, you know, Cowboy Ventures is very personal. It's like, and we're goofy and we're silly. And like when, like we have this new 
ritual when like when our portfolio companies have raised enough money to open like a, a, their first office, we send them a disco ball. <laughs> like if that's like, look, we're like goofy, we're like, we're, I can be myself now, mm -hmm. you know, whereas before I kind of feel like I was my sanitized self. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's a very personal business. It may never be more than three or four people. Um, but I think it will always be like very hands-on and personal and also very collaborative. Like what I think one of the things that Teresa and I are super excited about is like we've been friends basically since I started and we've never been able to co-invest because when you're a Series A or a Series B investor, you want as, from our firms, you want as much ownership as possible. So we could talk about deals and we could never figure out how to split them. And now we can work well, together actually, all the time. Actually, we could. We just yeah, couldn't always convince other people never who are less collaborative. Yeah, and, yeah, and so true. and no, seed, true. yeah, and seed is very collaborative. Like, I don't want to be the only institutional seed investor. Mm -hmm. I want to do it with Teresa and Jennifer or like other people. So that's a great thing that I love about what I'm doing now. One more question. Yes. Hi. My name is Karen Vasudavan, and um, I'm a vice president at Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. I. I really want to commend you on your leadership and impressiveness working in a male-dominated industry. And I'd love for you in closing to share, if you would, your own unique way, um, you know, share with us some secrets as to how you kicked ass in, in each of your space. Thanks. <laughs> and you, you've kicked more ass than all of us. So why don't you go? Thanks a lot, Lisa. You know, it's it's. Uh, I, I thought it would be easier to kick ass if you're tall like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, size does not matter. Apparently, <laughs> you know the. Uh, um, you know, one of the real early pioneers in the in the tech industry is a woman named Sandy Kritzik, and she did an interview recently. And people always ask us, us this question, and she said, you know, something very clearly. She goes, "Look, I've always been comfortable being a woman. I've never tried to act like the guys." Um, I grew up in a small town in Minnesota. My dad was the head basketball coach, so I can say that I was in the locker room at age three. Um, <laughs> my mother was unhappy with that, but my dad was in charge of me as the oldest. So I, I think you really just, the, the way you kick ass is just be comfortable with your own ass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I have no more to add than it. Yeah. That's just really the best. The best.